Um, uh, now I'm going to start and uh, uh, with with the first case here, and I'll show you various pathologies. Um, uh, this is a 64-year-old female who uh, noted numbness in her hands uh, about two years ago. Uh, she um, uh, had a progressive uh, numbness uh, with the right upper, then the right uh, uh, lower extremity, extending upper arms. Uh, sorry, uh, yeah, she had progressive numbness in the right upper more than the uh, left upper uh, extremities. Uh, and over the past uh, six months, she's been noticing that this has been worsening associated with gait uh, imbalance. On exam, uh, you noted that her strength is uh, normal in the uppers and lowers. She had some sensory deficits more than the uppers than the, in the lowers. And uh, when you tested her leaf reflexes, she had brisk, brisk, brisk reflexes. So when you look at this patient who comes in with progressive uh, symptoms involving the uppers and lowers matched with or accompanied with or associated with uh, brisk reflexes, uh, you would localize this, the lesion in, in, to the cervical spine because it, it's, it involves all four extremities. And since the uh, uh, patient has um, uh, brisk reflexes, it would also tell us that this is something that's probably uh, involving uh, uh, upper motor neuron uh, uh, regions causing upper motor neuron signs. So you would think of this and you would obtain an MRI of the cervical spine. And this is an abnormal MRI. You can see this is a sagittal T2 image. Why? Because CSF here is hypoattenuated or hypointense. And then you can see here that there's a lesion here just behind the second cervical vertebra, just behind it. And anytime you see a lesion uh, that may be representing um, a tumor or an infection, you want to put it in a compartment. What are the three compartments? You have extradural lesions and you have intradural lesions outside the dura and then inside the dura. And then for intradural lesions, they may be uh, between the dura and the uh, spinal cord or they be, can be in, intrinsic to the spinal cord. So intramedullary or extramedullary. And why is that important to put a lesion in a compartment? Because it will generate the differential diagnosis. Intradural lesions like this one, but extramedullary, uh, usually, the differential includes benign tumors, you know, meningiomas and or nerve sheath tumors, which include neurofibromas and uh, schwannomas. So you can see this lesion, space occupying lesion, definitely explains the patient's symptoms in terms of upper and lower extremity weakness and gait dystaxia, explains the signs in terms of brisk reflexes, positive Hoffman, uh, positive Hoffman and uh, you know, positive um, Romberg sign. You can see it occupies a big portion of the canal causing compression on the spinal cord. So this is one sequence. This is a sagittal T2. Why? Because the CSF here is uh, high, hyper attenuated or hyper intense. This is that same lesion. And if you look closely, there's like a cleft here between the lesion and the uh, spinal cord. You can see within the spinal cord, I don't know if you can see that, but there's a little bit of uh, increased signal presenting either a contusion or a, uh, a scar tissue, so, uh, so, or edema. So you can see this is a space occupying lesion, intradural, extramedullary, causing spinal cord compression, explaining the patient's symptom. Okay, so you generate your differential diagnosis, and uh, it includes a tumor, a uh, benign tumor, but in a bad location. And uh, the treatment of benign, slow-growing tumors, you definitely need to resync them uh, first of all, to remove the pressure off of the spinal cord. Second of all, to make a diagnosis. You know, these are not treated with uh, radiation or chemotherapy because they're slow growing. And you never do that if you don't know what the pathology is. So you take the patient to the OR and, you know, what you do is, I'm going to go back, you approach it posteriorly, remove the lamina, and then you open the dura to take the tumor out. You find a corridor here because you can't retract on the spinal cord to get and attack the tumor from the window that it gives you. And this is uh, after the laminectomy, head is on the, to the right side, feet to the left side, and that's the dura open. See, this is the dura opened, and we call these tack up sutures. We put four on neural on sutures to keep the dura tacked up on both sides. And then you see, this is the spinal cord. That's a C2 nerve root exiting the spinal cord ultimately through the foramina and then it ultimately uh, supplies the uh, bottom of the skull and um, 
a little bit posterior um, scalp area. And that's your tumor here. And um, you never to remove the tumor here on block because you can't retract on the spinal cord. So you remove it, what we call piecemeal, gently using uh, different instruments. We usually use the uh, ultrasonic aspirator, CUSA, uh, where we remove it. And then we, you know, we're happy with the uh, resection here. Uh, you can sacrifice that C2 nerve, uh, you know, if you want, or you can work around it, up to you. And that's the post-op scan after the tumor is resected. Looks okay. And, uh, you know, send the patient home and watch her and have her come back for, uh, you know, regular scans. Make sure that that tumor does not recur. Hey, everyone. Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.